Can't read. I gotta have my glasses on to see anyway. Well, thank you. And uh, this is now the assembly uh, debate, and the same basic format, although we have more candidates. Um, and let me just go over some of the uh, rules again. Uh, we ask that you have no signs or banners for any of the candidates on display. And again, no disruptions of any sort to occur during the debate. And we ask that you save your cheers and applause until the end of the questioning. And again, our questioners are John Fujian from the State House. He's a State House Bureau Chief for the Press of Atlantic City. And Sharon Shulman, the Special Assistant to the President <coughs> for External Affairs at Stockton College. And our timer is Corrine uh, Wilsley. I'm Michael Rodriguez, a political science professor at Richard Stockton College. We're going to have some opening statements before we get to the questions. And we did a, a toss, did we not? Okay, you want to the Republicans will make the op first opening statement, and we do it alphabetically. Yes. By last name. Oh. Okay, you mind if I go first? I'm an alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> those are the rules, okay? All right, those are the rules. Good evening. I am honored to be here this evening and want to thank Stockton and the press of Atlantic City for hosting this forum. And you, the audience, for joining us tonight. I know everyone is sick and tired of politicians who tell you what you want to hear. I don't believe in that. I believe and have always believed and I tell you how I feel and I stand by my commitment. It takes that kind of approach and conviction to tackle the greatest challenge facing New Jersey right now. The belief that government programs once started should never be revoked. That men mentality has put this state and our families on the path of bankruptcy. Think about it. If things in Trenton don't change, every baby born in New Jersey will be obligated to pension and debt service to the tune of $20,000. And in 20 years, that child will be responsible for $11,250 in, in property taxes. That's if you don't think of change. As your assemblyman, I'm changing things in Trenton. I voted to rein in uncontrolled government spending and cap property taxes at 2%. I voted for landmark legislation that addresses pension liabilities for the first time, saving taxpayers $120 billion. Most importantly, I sponsored the most significant jobs bill for our area with S11, creating the Atlantic City Tourism District, all without increasing taxes. But it's still not enough. We need to give towns the tools to keep property taxes in control. We need to expand property tax relief programs. Uh, thank we, you very much. We're, we're doing uh, two minute uh, introductions, and now uh, Chris Brown? Oh, I didn't even see. Were there? Well, yeah, we have a uh, time. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. Mr. Right. Brown? Good evening and welcome. I'm Chris Brown, candidate for the New Jersey General Assembly. I decided to seek public office because I'm tired of elected officials uh, making decisions which are not in the best interests of our state, but rather favor party politics for partisan advantage. During my campaign, I have visited your homes. I've listened to your concerns. I understand your desire for hardworking, honest <clears throat> individuals who will put your interests first. As your assemblyman, I will put aside petty political gamesmanship so we can honestly address the issues that confront all of us. Some of those issues are such as lowering property taxes, stabilizing spending so we can create an environment for job growth and economic recovery. As a parent, I'm blessed with three children, Matthew, Danny, and Mallory. All of our children deserve the opportunity to stay in the state of New Jersey. All of our children deserve the opportunity to afford a home without fear of being taxed out of it. All of our children deserve the opportunity to embark on a career of their choosing. When you vote, you place your trust, confidence, and hopes for the future in the person that you choose. My campaign is dedicated to this belief, and I will work hard to justify your trust and earn your confidence. 
As an officer in the United States Army, twice activated for war, it was essential for me to provide leadership with uncompromising integrity and dedication. As a small business owner, I understand the pressures of meeting payroll in tough economic times when my employees depend upon me for their livelihood. As a judge and prosecutor, I was tough on crime and worked to prevent, protect all our families. Now, I want to put my experience to work for all of us. Imagine a government that's accountable, responsible, and delivers measurable results. Thank you. Working together, we can accomplish this. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, on the Democratic side, uh, Elisa Cooper will go first for two minutes. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank Stockton College and the Press of Atlantic City for hosting tonight's debate. My name is Elisa Cooper, and before I begin tonight, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who I am. I was born and raised right here in Atlantic City, and I'm a proud graduate of Atlantic City High School and the University of Maryland. I've been a music teacher for over 20 years, and my orchestra performs for many groups and charities across Atlantic County. I'm also a wife and a mother and the proud daughter of the late Dolores Cooper, who served our region with distinction as a county freeholder and then as a member of the State Assembly. From her, I learned the importance of public service and the value of always being there to help any constituent with any issue, large or small. I will be a voice for the average working men and women of this state, and I will stand up for the most vulnerable among us, our seniors, our children, our veterans. For the for the past six years, I have served on the Atlantic County Board of Freeholders, where I've worked across party lines to balance budgets and to save jobs. Send me to Trenton with Damon Tyner to represent you in the assembly, and I'll be an advocate for the taxpayers, holding politicians accountable to explain how and where they're spending your tax dollars. The middle class is suffering like never before, Property taxes growing up, families are struggling to make ends meet, and too many people lost their jobs. We need new blood in Trenton. Business as usual will not work. I will provide the leadership to help make New Jersey a better place to live and a better place to work. Thank you so very much. I think, um, Damon Tyner. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Um, before we came on this evening, uh, it was brought to my attention that we had a tragedy today in Atlantic City where uh, two gentlemen that were working on the Revel project uh, were injured and struck by lightning. Uh, one passed away and one is still hospitalized. Um, so with that, this debate sort of pales in comparison and I would like to donate a minute of my opening to uh, a moment of silence. Thank you. As I indicated, uh, this sort of pales in comparison this evening, but, uh, and John, as a, as a union crane operator, I'm sure he agrees when times like these happen, uh, but we must go on. And elections are about choices. And on November 8th, the voters will have a clear-cut choice that will help decide the future of Atlantic County and the state of New Jersey. Uh, we can choose to create jobs, jumpstart the economy, and we can choose to make New Jersey affordable for the middle class. Or we can settle for what we've settled for in the past. Problems, frankly, that have been created by both Democratic and Republican administrations. It's time that we put those things aside and that we work together. People, I think, are tired of the partisan arguments that, they, that get involved down in Washington. They're simply tired of it. I can tell you that your priorities are our priorities. We've listened to you during this campaign. We will make the right choices for you if we're elected. And know that Lisa Cooper and I will fight for the middle class and seniors. Thank you very much. And now we'll begin the questioning. Our first question from Sharon Schulman. Right, and, we're, and just to reiterate, we'll do two minutes to the one person getting the question. 
the running mate will get one minute, and then the opposite party will each get one minute. Uh, and I'll start with Freeholder Cooper and ask, why do you think casino revenues continue to decline six months after casino deregulation and the tourism district laws were enacted? And do you think more changes are needed? And if so, what? Okay, well, certainly uh, the casino revenues are declining, and that certainly relates to the economy. And if people don't have money for their taxes, and people don't have money for food, and people don't have money for basics, they're certainly not going to have money to gamble. Um, th that's a common sense approach. When we talk about the economy, though, the bottom line is we have to start looking at priorities, and those priorities are jobs. Um, we talk about the casino industry. Yes, there has been a decline over the past couple of years, but when you see from the decline as to currently what's going on, just look right down the street or a little bit further down the street to revel. As we're sitting here tonight, 2,000 jobs, and again, very tragically, and as my running mate, my colleague just mentioned, again, very tragically, somebody lost their life today. But 2,000 men and women are working to build Revel. That is certainly going to help our economy. When Revel is completed in 2012, there will be 5,000 jobs. We've already had conversations and dialogue with Kevin DeSanctis, and that's a guarantee that's been given to us. And even more beneficial is 1,000 Atlantic City residents will be guaranteed jobs at the Revel. So again, we're looking at the economy. We're looking at the casino industry. There has been a downturn. Again, it's with the economy, but you have to be positive, and I'm very positive. Um, even just this past week, we have a new director, Mr. Palmieri. Um, with the talent, with the expertise that we have coming in and that's here, we're, we're, on, the, we're on a good path. Now, the order of the responses will be one minute, Mr. Tyner, one minute, Mr. Amadeo, one minute, Mr. Brown. Mr. Tyner? As a land use attorney, I've worked on casino projects, on the development of them. Uh, I was proud to be a young attorney working on the development of Borgata uh, when it was just plans on, uh, uh, in an architect's mind. Uh, I was happy to be a part of the expansion of Harris uh, in the marina when they responded to Borgata's emergence into this market. Uh, the bottom line is that we believed for so long that casino gaming was a recession-proof business, and we've seen tragically that it isn't. Uh, as Lisa indicated, people have to buy food now. Gas is, uh, the price of gas has increased. As a result of that, they're going to the new casinos that are in uh, neighboring uh, jurisdictions that are closer to their homes. Uh, so the reality is that, you know, we need to revive this market. We need new inventory. And I'm committed to ensuring that uh, I supported the deregulation bill that uh, Senator Whalen uh, support it, and we can do it. Thank you, Mr. Tyner. Now, Mr. Amadeo, one minute, please. The issue is the fact competition is affecting our bottom line in Atlantic City. We had to go to work, create the legislation, put the tools in place so that not only the casinos themselves, the, the owners can run their business and not hear from the regulatory side and have the state tell them what to do, let them run their business, and through the the legislation that was created, especially with S-12, the DREG bill, that is still being looked at. It's still a work in progress as we move forward. The Division of Gaming Enforcement will perfect those through regulations and changes as we move forward. We'll see changes and we'll never be able to overcome what's happened with the national gambling passing everywhere. What we have to do is we have to market our town, we have to become a total destination resort, and we have the diamond in the rough about 15 miles west of us with the airport. We've got to figure out a solution to get people moved from the airport right into Atlantic City. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Our final response, Mr. Brown. As a small business owner, I learned quickly, if you don't grow your business, you don't adapt to change, you're not going to survive. The same rules that I have to apply in the private sector as a business owner apply to government as well. For too long, Atlantic City sat stagnant while the other, uh, other municipalities and other states gained gaming and crept up on us. Right now, our short-term goal is clear, and what we need to do is stabilize the casino industry, which is what we're in the process of doing. We created the tourism district, we've centralized the market plan, and we are in the process of working through the zoning and planning. 
In addition, then we need to revitalize it. We're doing that through bringing in the Revel, through hopefully getting uh, the other casinos as well. But we have to continue to demolish the decay, make it safer, make it cleaner. And then finally, in order to compete, in order to grow and adapt and be, be number one so that we can continue to provide jobs, we have to make sure that we energize it, and that's through the air show and art center, Thank you, thinking outside the box so that we're able to bring Stop. in these types Mr. of Mr. Brown, thank you very much. Thank you. And now the next question is from John. Ken, we'll start with Assemblyman Amadeo. Uh, what would you like to see the new director of the CRDA accomplish in the first six months? I think we have a great goal with the tools in place as he steps forward, as he starts his new job on October 3rd, I believe it is. I think the key as we move forward, the economic development concept where we can start creating and enticing through tax incentives and all the work that we've done through the two bills that were passed to be able to allow him to come in and entice development nationally. We, we have to get everything working together, gelled. He should be able to have the opportunity to uh, market our product worldwide because he has recognition on the achievements he's made in other towns like Hartford, uh, Boston, and Charlotte. So I really look forward to his innovative concepts of bringing an enticing development so we can have further development come in, and that's what creates the jobs in the short term on the construction side, and ultimately we'll have permanent long-term sustaining jobs to put our local people to work, and that's what makes our communities thrive is when our local people are back to work. You have more time if you want to use it, or you want to yield the rest of the I'm time? I'm fine. Now? Okay. So the order of the responses will be Mr. Yeah, Brown, Mr. Brown, Ms. Cooper, and Mr. Tyner. Right. The first thing that I'd like to see him do is start implementing uh, the master plan by promoting uh, an organized attempt at redesignating the district. In the past, it has not been done in a way that promotes growth in an orderly manner. Uh, one of the things that we should look towards doing is making sure that we have a, a theater district. They also have uh, the Eds and Meds where we can create a public-private partnership so that we can bring uh, a pair up with uh, Stockton College and Rutgers College and put within our own city uh, an opportunity for building and create those jobs and have more growth. Uh, the other thing that they're working on, which I'd like to see them continue, is cleaning up the district. Uh, they're doing a good job at it, but it, it, of course, needs more work combined with making the district safer. One of the things that they're doing to make the district safer, they're sweeps in the morning and they're getting the people from out from under, but not in a mean manner, in a holistic Thank manner. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brown. And now, Ms. Cooper, one minute, please. Thank you. As I mentioned in my opening statement, I'm born and raised in Atlantic City, and I don't think there's anybody as passionate about this city as I am. I love this city, and I am such a staunch supporter. Um, as, a side note, as a side note, I opened Resorts International in, in the Rendezvous Lounge in 1978. And I remember the city with the casinos when they all first started to open. Unfortunately, there's been a downturn. So now we have Mr. Palmieri, who's here, and I am very, very excited. I have not had the pleasure or honor to meet him yet, but I'm sure within the next couple of weeks I will. We have to work together. That's imperative. We have to promote our natural assets. We have to make incentives for business, encourage development. Of course, we've been talking about jobs. That's an understatement. And when you put all of these elements together, and also something it's not a positive topic, but we have to do something about the crime. When you put everything together, and again, with people working together, with industries working together, we're going to be successful again. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tyner, one minute. Thank you. I think we need to get back to the title of the authority. It's the Casino Reinvestment Development Authority. We need to, the, I, would, the, I would want the executive director to not only look at the tourism district, but look at the entire city, work with his professionals, look at the blight that exists, and come up with a blight plan, a, a plan to remove the blight throughout the entire city, and also work with respect to uh, the commander, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gilbert, uh, to ensure that the tourism district, while safe, uh, you know, while clean, uh, it is necessary. But we have to look at the entire city. If you look at the 
uh, largest landowner in the city of Atlantic City. It's the CRDA. If you look at the largest owner of blight in the city, it's the CRDA. If they simply maintain their own properties, we would go a long way to improving the vision of the city. Thank you very much. Well, our third, uh, third and again, uh, if, if we could just hold the applause until the end of the debate so we can get through all the questions. Our third question is from Sharon Shulman. Um, thank you. And this, we'll start this one with you, Mr. Tyner. Um, suppose control of the legislature, the House and the Senate, suppose they split between the two parties. Would the two houses be able to work together? And if so, what would you personally do if the second legislative district delegation is split to make sure that it works for the best interest of the district. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, like everyone else here, uh, except maybe for Jim Whalen, I was born and raised in Atlantic City. Uh, I know my uh, opponents very well. Uh, Assemblyman Amadeo, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, it's no secret that I sit on uh, the Chief Arthur Brown Foundation uh, as a trustee. Uh, I am committed to working across party lines. I'm committed to getting things done. I'm committed to being effective. If I can't be effective, then I don't need to be in the legislature. I can't understand uh, people that uh, go to Trenton uh, for the title, that go to Trenton and get nothing done, that go to Trenton for the photo ops. If, if that's all my life in Trenton would be, then I'd give it up immediately. Also, I think I'm committed to disagreeing with folks without being disagreeable. Uh, I've made that a hallmark of my professional career. It's a hallmark of my personal uh, life, and I live by that. So as a result of that, I look forward to working with anyone, whether they're a Democrat or a Republican, because I'm telling you, the problems that are facing us, they were created by both parties. But we have to stop blaming folks. We have to stop the blame game. That's what voters are telling me when I go out and knock on their doors. They're telling me that they want people that are going to be effective and get things done. So as a result of that, my pledge and my commitment to all of you, to all of you that are here, to all of you that are listening or watching the via the web, is that I will work with anyone if they're for making this state more affordable for seniors and middle class families. Thank you. Now the, um, the order of the one minute responses will be Ms. Cooper, Mr. Amadeo, and Mr. Brown. Regarding the question, how would I work with if this legislature is split? First, the most important word that comes to mind here is compromise. And being a freeholder for the past six years, um, that's a word that's in my vocabulary every Tuesday afternoon at 4 o'clock at the freeholder meeting. You have to work with your colleagues. Hopefully I'm successful and I am elected to the New Jersey State Assembly. And depending on what the composition is, of the winners, whoever they might be on November 8th, it's a matter of working together. And as I said, I've had experience. Some of the things that I would talk to my colleagues about would be freezing government spending, doing audits of all state departments, creating tax incentives for the entire state, retooling jobs, 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 jobs. That's our, our, our main focus of this campaign. And do something about property tax relief. Because quite honestly, you know this, we're the most expensive state in the nation. I would hope my colleagues would see it my way. Thank you. Now, Mr. Medell, one minute. Yes, I entered the legislature uh, with a Democratic control in both houses and a Democratic governor. I can tell you, since the time Governor Christie has taken office in uh, January 19th of 2010, we've seen a lot of things happen. It's probably been the busiest time in the legislature in, the, in this state's history. Uh, we've seen sessions in the summer. and. That is what the key is. We need to gain one of the houses. It's a long reach in the assembly, but any time you, had, you have both houses, one favor, they post all the bills. Every voting session, there's 100 bills posted, none, no Republican bills. So I've been successful. I've always worked with my Democratic colleagues, and I'm proud of that, and I've had success with it. But we need to gain in one of the houses, and it's more likely to gain it in the Senate because there's fewer to achieve. So we have to strive in that direction. And bipartisanship is the key of getting things done, and the governor's express shown that to everyone here. Thank you. Now, Mr. Brown, one minute. 
As a boy, I grew up in the house where my father was in public service and he rose to be the chief of the Atlantic City Beach Patrol. And one of the things that he taught me as a young boy was that we treat everybody the same, no matter who they are. Whether you're a Democrat, whether you're, you're Republican, whether you're uh, white, whether you're African American, no matter who you are or what you are, you treat everybody the same with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Now as I learned that growing up, uh, I applied that to my life. And when my father uh, was the chief, he worked under Jim Usry, and obviously a Democrat or Republican, but uh, they worked together with a Democrat council. He also worked uh, under Willie Clayton. And the compromise and the teamwork that they exhibited is what carries through to me. Since my father passed, we started a nonprofit scholarship uh, organization. Obviously, uh, uh, years ago, I had invited Damon to join it. His father uh, is a friend of mine, and I enjoy Mr. Tyner very much. That is some of the things that I have thank learned you, and how Johnson. I would carry through. Okay, thank you. Now, our fourth question will be from John. We'll start with Mr. Brown. Yes, sir. How would your budget priorities differ from the opposition's? Well, <laughs> you know, again, as a uh, small businessman, I understand the need to grow the economy so that you can create jobs. Uh, one of the things that has been proposed by the other party is this so-called millionaire's tax. And as a judge and a prosecutor, one of the things that I learned early on was before you make a decision about other people's lives, you got to research the issue, make sure you get it right, and then give your opinion. So when I first heard about the millionaire's tax, it sure sounded great. Take from the rich, give to the poor, Robin Hood, we all love it. But when you look at it and you do your homework and you do your research, you learn something quite different. And what you learn is Boston College did a study on interstate migration. And what they found was that over 300,000 upper income homes have left our state over the past eight years with the tax rate that's in place. The next thing you learn is, oh, there already is a tax on the millionaires. And just so everybody's aware, there's no personal interest. I'm not even close to it, okay? <laughs> but there already is a tax at the $500,000 level. And at that point, your rate goes from uh, six point four to eight point nine. So we already have this tax that they're saying we need. It already exists. The last thing is this article, there was an article written, it was written by the uh, Star Ledger. And in that ledger they quoted Dean Hughes from uh, Rutgers Public Policy and Planning. And he said, until the tax structure is improved, our residents will continue to leave our state until no one is left. Anybody who thinks you can tax and spend your way out of a recession, I believe, is very wrong. And we need to grow grow economy so that we can get the jobs here. And if you know the facts, Thank that's you. the truth. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, the order of the one-minute responses will be Mr. Amadeo, Ms. Cooper, and Mr. Tyner. Actually, our opposition favored increasing taxes during the eight years they were in control from 2002 till Governor Christie took office, there was 117 new taxes created in this state. 117 in an eight year period. The governor came in to a $32 billion budget that had a $3 billion deficit and to meet the constitutional requirement to, to present a, you know, a balanced budget he had to cut within the first two months of his off in office and bring and rein in exp expenses. Through that process, we did cut a lot of programs, kept good programs, and as far as where I'm at with the opposition on budget, as long as we're spending what we take in through revenue source and we're able to control taxes and not create taxes and not tax people, we're going to be able to entice development bring jobs back to our communities, and put people back to work. Thank you. Now, Ms. Cooper, one minute. The question is, what would I have done different with the budget? Let me tell you. No. Uh, your, how, your budget priorities, how it differs from the opposition. Absolutely. Forgive me. My priorities about the budget, there isn't a question, in the, a question or a doubt in my mind. I would first address the $7.5 million that was cut 
for women's health care. First off, when you had $42 million, it was available in matching funds. What, what, what don't you understand about that? Each one of you in this room tonight, I hope, has an important woman in your life, maybe your mother, your sister, a daughter, a niece, somebody. And right now, as I've been on the campaign trail, I've spoken to more women that have lost their jobs. And you lose your job, you lose your health benefits. Right now, women in this state can't get a pap smear, can't get a mammogram, and then I'm talking about basic testing. This is just not right. It's not human. I'm talking about basic routine care, and that would have been the first thing I would have addressed with regard to the budget. There's also family care, care for families with low. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Thank you. Mr. Tyner, one, one minute, please. Well, one minute, Mr. Tyner. Elisa started with some of her priorities with respect to restoring women's health care funding. Uh, unlike my opponents, I'm actually going to answer the question. We need to create jobs. As a result of that, I would favor uh, incentives for small businesses. Uh, as the senator spoke about earlier with respect to uh, giving small businesses guaranteed loans up to $250,000. Small businesses are the economic drivers of this country. They create the most jobs, not the wealthiest one half percent. And that's not me saying that, by the way. That's Ronald Reagan who said that in 1984. I would ensure that education parity funding for all. A kid should not be limited in their education as a result of their zip code. It's just not fair. Lastly, I would ensure that a priority for me is restoring the senior homestead rebates for seniors. Very, very important. Our seniors should not be taxed out of the state. Thank you. Now our next uh, question will come from Sharon. Yes, and we'll start with Freeholder Cooper, but I'm going to ask all of you to please try and be very specific with your answer. Um, I'd like you to briefly address a few environmental issues, if you would. Um, the environmentalists say that the Christie administration so far is a mixed bag. So I would like to know if enough is being done to protect clean water, address sprawl, and do you support New Jersey pulling out of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, Reggie? I totally, fully support Reggie. Let's make sure that we all understand what Reggie is about. Reggie was created to preserve our environment, our beautiful environment. And right here, as we're in Atlantic City, just a few blocks away, we're talking about beautiful beaches, pristine beaches, our pine lands if we go a little further up. And we have to ensure, we have to guarantee that future generations can enjoy those beaches, the pine lands, make sure we have clean water, make sure our environment is a good environment. Again, I support Reggie. Let's look at how much money has been generated by Reggie already. $65 million has been generated by Reggie. And what did the governor do with it? He didn't use it to promote anything, to protect anything. He used $65 million to plug the budget. It could have been used to create jobs, and that's what the, Reggie, the original purpose and intent was, to create jobs, again, to protect, protect our beautiful environment. And when we talk about the environment and energy. Let's take a look at solar energy. Let's take a look at wind energy. All you have to do is go over to the White Horse Bike and look and you've got the beautiful windmills right over there at the ACUA. We have to make sure that we create jobs and that's what the intent of Reggie was, to create what we now call green jobs, high tech jobs. We have to keep up with other countries because right now other countries are getting ahead of us. We're the greatest country in the world and if we don't support Reggie and protect our environment, they're going to keep getting way ahead of us. Again, we've got a beautiful country, a beautiful, as I said, our beaches, our pine lands, and we have to use the right technology. We have to be creative, and we have to do what's right for our state and our area. Thank you. Now, the order of one-minute responses will be Mr. Tyner, Mr. Amadeo, and Mr. Brown. To dovetail on some of the things that Lisa just spoke about with respect to the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, it's important to understand that the $64 million uh, that had been set aside for that fund uh, was set aside for the purpose of not only saving our environment, but creating green jobs. 
Uh, all of you may have heard earlier some of Senator Whalen's initiatives with respect to converting boat builders into windmill builders. Uh, folks, this isn't Don Quixote. It's very possible. Uh, we're going to have windmills off of Steel Pier uh, very shortly as a result of legislation sponsored by Senator Whalen. Critical. Uh, it's also very important that we understand that, you know, this money was used to cover the general fund. It was taken out of Reggie. It was used for the general fund, similar to what Governor Whitman did when she robbed Peter to pay Paul and she stole from the pension benefit systems of public employees. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tyler. Um, that's Mr. Medell, $62 million my colleagues talk about was needed to repair a budget that the governor was handed after misuse and abuse and tax that the Democrats did over eight years, as I said earlier. Reggie is nothing more than a tax on the user. We, as consumers, would, without even knowing at this point what we would get hit with, would, had no value. The cost of living in the state of New Jersey is the highest in the country. We had to pull back. Our governor has presented an energy master plan, which includes all the above of what my colleagues are claiming that the governor is not concerned about creating green jobs, green technology, and moving forward that has been totally received by the environmental groups. The other thing that the governor has been uh, steadfast with is the Offshore Economic Wind Development Act, which I was a prime sponsor on. All these are initiatives moving forward. As far as clean water, we have clean water. Uh, former Governor Whitman. Thank you very much. Sorry. One minute response. Um, Mr. Brown. The, the debate as it's phrased is a little off. Uh, we all agree that the goal uh, of energy efficiency, the goal of conservation to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions is important. And it's something we should all strive to accomplish. The difference is whether as my opponents want to do, do you punish your citizens or do you use incentives to accomplish it? Now, if we understand it uh, and we really look at it, like I said before, before you start speaking about something, you really should research the issue and understand what you're talking about. The cost uh, of doing business was hoped to be changed so that it became too costly for businesses to continue with the energy that they were using. So they created an allowance which could be bought and sold or, or traded amongst the different parties. And they were hoping that the cost of the admission per ton would be 20 to $30, which would make it cost prohibitive. It was only 2 to $3, and the cost was Thank passed you, on Brown. to the taxpayer. Now, our, um, our, next, our, our next question will be from uh, John. We'll start with Assemblyman Amadeo. Yes, sir. Do you consider horse breeding and horse racing to be just another business, or is it a special industry with public value that deserves public financial support? What's the difference between subsidies for racing and state help in financing Revel? Well, first off, our horse racing, our horse industry in the state of New Jersey is probably a $3 billion industry and probably employs 30 to 40,000 people statewide. So, the horse industry in the state of New Jersey is important to our economy. However, for a, a separate industry to support and pay money as in a form of blackmail, in a sense, to keep them going in the direction that they needed to with the racetracks is not the way to do business in the state of New Jersey. The governor has put his plan forward. He is showing support for the racetracks. We see what he's doing in, in the Meadowlands. We saw what he did with the legislation that was signed into law back a year ago with, the, uh, with Monmouth Park, increasing the race days and, 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 and supplementing the purse supplements without using casino funds. The ultimate goal would be to see horse racing and the horse industry survive in the state of New Jersey, and I believe the governor's working in that direction. Casinos in no way should be funding them to the tune of $15 million a year, supporting them so that that industry could take the purse subsidies, pay them to individuals that come from all over the country, Kentucky, racetracks all over, let them win the money, and take the money right out of our state. That's not how it should work. They have to be able to shore themselves up, be a viable industry, the jobs will be there, and yes, 
The horse industry is a big, important part of our economy, and we have to do what we have to do without putting taxpayer funds towards it or putting casino funds to it. They have, it's like a business. You have to be able to support yourself. If you can't support yourself, it's time to look at your business model and make changes. Thank you for the question. Now, the order of the one-minute responses will be Mr. Brown, Ms. Cooper, Mr. Tyner. You know, as a uh, small business owner, I understand that you need to be able to survive on your own two feet. You can't run your business and then run a deficit and ask somebody else to continue to give you revenue. Uh, the, the, the real world just doesn't work that way. If there's a business out there within the, the, the open market and it's not succeeding, it fails and another one takes its place hopefully. Well, with the horse racing industry, it needs to either stand or fall on its own two feet. Our casino industry, as Mr. Tyner mentioned earlier, the CRDA needs to reinvest in itself. And I'm proud of Governor Christie, and I think you all would agree, as residents of the second district, to have somebody for the first time since maybe Governor Byrne who actually cares about our district. He said no more. You don't take the revenue out of that second district. Those casinos and those people are too important. We have local 54 struggling right now, trying to pay their bills. And, and, and I'm proud of the governor Thank you, Mr. for Brown. stopping that. Now, Ms. Cooper, one minute. I have to reminisce for just one moment as I answer this question. I remember the beautiful Atlantic City racetrack and spending so many evenings there back with my parents and my friends back in the 70s in the heyday when it was the place to go. So I just had to add that. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. And again, part of the old, shall we say, Atlantic City history. But let's bring, bring this issue up to 2011. The race, racing industry needs to stand on its own. Again, right now, let's look at Atlantic City itself. We really must concentrate all efforts. Every effort has to be concentrated on jobs, Rebuilt, getting Greville completed in 2012, looking at the hard rock, and look at what's, what's coming up down the road. There's a whole long list. As we mentioned, we have Mr. Palmieri, who's just joined us with the CRDA, and the potential, it's going to be wonderful. So again, the horse racing industry, it is important, but again, I think we need to focus on jobs, 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 and... Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Uh, Mr. Tyner, one minute. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Look, I said it earlier, when someone's right, I'll agree with them, and when someone's wrong, I'm going to stand up to them. Uh, I agree with both Assemblyman Amadeo and Mr. Brown with respect to their position on the horse racing industry. I could never understand why we were sending millions of dollars up the road to various racetracks, and our own Atlantic City racetrack never got a dime from any of that money. How could you even do that? How can it even, if anyone is going to get taken care of first, if any racetrack was going to get taken care of, it should have been Atlantic City racetrack. And guess what? Right before those subsidies was cut off, were cut off, Atlantic City racetrack, for the first time ever, was slated to finally receive some funds. So I disagree with sending that money up the road to racetracks. Let that industry succeed or fail on its own. That money should be used to market Atlantic City and market the casino industry. Thank you. Now we have time for one more round of questions. Well, no, now this, we're, we're going to have two questions, but this one will be the shorter one where everybody gets one minute to please tell what it is about your background that makes you uniquely qualified for this elected office. And I would like to start with Mr. Tyner. Thank you. Um, as we indicated earlier, I was born and raised in Atlantic City. Uh, actually, strike that. I was born in Summers Point, New Jersey, something that I didn't find out until I was 16 years old when I went to go get working papers. So I might fail the test. But I was raised in Atlantic City and went through public schools and uh, graduated from Holy Spirit High School. I went on to college at Howard University and graduated from Widener University School of Law. I was very proud to come back to this city uh, where my father, retired inspector of police, Hank Tyner, gave so much uh, to this community to continue his legacy of public service, along with my brother, Michael Graham, who's in the audience this evening and is an Atlantic City police officer. Uh, I'm an attorney. I'm a land use lawyer. I'm an education lawyer. 
I have dealt with budgets for schools. I have unique qualifications that can bring practical, common sense solutions to the difficult problems that are facing this district and our state. Thank you. Now, the order of responses will be Ms. Cooper, Mr. Amadeo, Mr. Brown. One minute, please. Thank you. Once again, I was born and raised in Atlantic City, and I love this town. There's no question about it. I love this area. Yeah. What can I bring? Why am I qualified? I've had the honor the past six years, as I mentioned earlier, to be a member of the Atlantic County Board of Freeholders, and I have gathered and gained much experience and expertise in government. There's no other way to say it. And I really know the workings in and out of what makes efficient, accessible, available, and accountable government. I want to take what I've learned the past six years and just take it right up to 06, up to Trenton. I want to take it up to 06 because I will be a voice, those of you that know me, maybe a little bit of a loud voice, to address the problems, to address the problems because there are so many. People are hurting and so many people need a voice, someone to look out for them and I'm going to be that person in Trenton. As I said, I care about people. I Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Thank you. Now, Mr. Amadeo, one minute. Yes. Making the right choice for the taxpayers of the state of New Jersey is my simple answer. Elections are a referendum on performance. And I'm the candidate with the proven experience and record of, of supporting reform. That's reducing spending, help revitalize the economy, and create family-sustaining jobs. I am proud of my record. I'm proud to have represented the second district for the past close to four years, and I would like to continue in the direction that we started. Along with my colleague Vince Palestine and myself, we've made great accomplishments in a short 19th, 20-month period with Governor Christie at the helm. And I think you've seen in a short period of time the direction the governor has put this city in is where I want to be in another two years running for re-election with Atlantic City totally turned around, a vibrant economy, and people traveling from all Thank over you, the Mr. country Madel. coming into Atlantic City. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Sorry, Brown. Mike. I get carried away. <laughs> That's quite, quite all right. <laughs> uh, Mr. Brown, one minute, please. I have a life history of uh, being put in leadership positions. And really what we are looking for is not some weak-kneed politician who's going to go down to Trenton and either do what the political bosses tell them to do, but somebody is going to stand up and actually fight for what you need and what you want here in our district. Now, as a combat veteran who was activated two times, I understand the needs of our veterans. I understand the needs of their families as well as those overseas fighting. That makes me uniquely qualified. As a small business owner, I understand the pressures of meeting payroll. I understand the need to lower taxes and reduce spending so businesses like my own can grow and create those jobs. You know, you can say jobs, 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 but that doesn't mean that you know how to create them. I'm proud that I've run a scholarship foundation for over 20 years, and we've provided over $200,000 to kids within our community. I'm proud of the work that I've done with the NAACP as a legal redress committee person. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I believe we have one more question. Okay, no, I this will be uh, one minute responses or the no, traditional no, the format. Regular. 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 And uh, regular start format? with Mr. Brown. I asked it before. Should Chris Christie run for president? Why or why not? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I love his no nonsense approach. The problem I have with Governor Christie is some of the rhetoric. It needs to be toned down. Our brothers and our sisters within this region, leaders are supposed to bring together, not divide. And so that part of his leadership, I, I don't like. But the part of his leadership that has the courage to say to people, I can't pander to you. I'm going to tell you like it is. We're going to have to tighten our belts. 117 new taxes, an $11 billion deficit, tripled the debt in the time that they controlled it. Property taxes went up 56% during the time the Democrats were in control. Unemployment is at 10%. That's not how we left it under our watch. And so I am proud of him for having the courage to say, we can't give you money anymore just because you're asking for it. We have to prioritize. We have to make sure that we spend within our budget. And we have to do it wisely. 
And if you look around, I believe you will notice that we used to be 50th in the country and we're now 48th in being business friendly. We're still number one in property tax relief, but his no-nonsense attitude is what we need in order to try to make sure we continue to lower our property taxes. Now, if he were to go to Washington, I would love that from the standpoint I'd love to see the federal government stop spending money they don't have, work together, but I like him here in our state. Uh, I believe although he's caustic at times and I believe although he's a divider at times, ultimately we have to understand that politicians or people elected are the stewards of your money. And as a steward of your money, when I go to my accountant in the private sector and I say I want to spend more money, he says you don't have it, so I don't spend it. What's wrong with paying down the debt? Is that a novel idea? This budget that the governor proposed, 27.9 million, he gave it to the Democrats in an opportunity to act in, in cooperation, Thank and you, they Mr. came Brown. back with 900 million additional spending. Thank you. The order of uh, responses, one minute responses, will be Mr. Amadeo, Ms. Cooper, Mr. Tyner. First off, I'd like to respond by saying I personally enjoy Governor Christie's candor and his way of getting things done, and he is getting them done. I had the opportunity to personally talk to him face to face and asked him the question when this first rose. His interest, and everybody in this room knows, everybody has a boss. And his simple answer to that question was, Mary Pat has no intention of letting me go to Washington. <laughs> so unfortunately and very fortunately, we have our governor, and hopefully he'll win re-election in 2014 to, to run this state in the right direction as he has set the agenda for us to achieve. So I don't see the governor going to Washington immediately in the long term. I think he's set his profile and his agenda to meet the needs of what he wants to do in his future political career. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Cooper, one minute, please. Should Governor Christie go to Washington? That's his choice. That's his party's choice. But let me tell you how I feel about the governor. Yes, I've met the governor. I've been in his company several times. A little over a year ago, he came to Atlanta County in the middle of a snowstorm, three feet of snow on the ground, and the governor came down here. I was very impressed. He was here last summer, signed the tour, pardon me, last February, signed the tourism bill. I was very, very impressed. And again, when he does something right or something positive, I'll be the very first person to say, good job, governor. However, I'm not real happy with, with what he's done to seniors, veterans, women, particularly women, education. There's a long list of things I'm not happy with. I'm going to put my teacher hat on for just one moment, and if I were to give him a grade right now of the job he's doing, it would probably be incomplete. And then putting my teacher hat on, should he go to Washington? Again, that's your decision. But over in the comment side, you know where the teacher writes it? I would probably write he doesn't play well with others. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Tyler, one minute, please. <laughs> Can I wait until everyone settles down? Please, please. Mr. Tyler, one minute. Please, folks. Thank you very much. Um, whether or not Governor Christie decides to run for president, run for vice president, that doesn't make much difference to me. Uh, what matters to me is the 12.9% of unemployment rate in Atlanta County. That's three percentage point, three and a half percentage points higher than the entire state of New Jersey, which has a 9.6% unemployment rate, which is higher than the federal rate, which is 9.1%. Those are the things that matter to me. With respect to whether or not he should run for president, I would rather he focus his attention on decreasing unemployment working for seniors, working for veterans, working for the disabled, and putting folks back to work rather than chasing the Koch brothers around the country to figure out how he can make them more money. Thank you. We are over time, so we have, this uh, will be the round of the closing statements. Yes. Uh, one minute apiece. I actually forget how, what order we have for the opening statements. Oh, uh, who spoke, who went first Mr. for the opening statements? Mr. Amadeo went Mr. Amadeo, Mr. Amadeo. Mr. Brown, Ms. Cooper, and Mr. Tyner. One minute, please. Uh, Mr. Amadeo.
I start? You start, Mr. Okay. Brown, Ms. Cooper, Mr. Tyner. One minute. Well, I would have to agree with Ms. Cooper on one issue. Assemblyman Del Dolores Cooper was a great public servant. Thank you. Her daughter is not the model that her mother was. Her mother, her mother was a Republican elected re official that worked hard for this district. I think Ms. Cooper needs to spend more time in her professional career as a teacher, spending time in a classroom and teaching kids music and the arts and, and singing. And I'm sure she can be credible at doing that. First off, her information about women's health care that was taken out of the budget is not true. 4.6 million of health care went back in the governor's budget, which she doesn't know about because the additional funds were extra money that the Democrats always put into the tune of 7.1, just that sat in, in the health care. As far as rebates, they've been in, reinstated in the form of a credit. So all the seniors in this room must Thank know much, that uh, through their tax Mr. bills, Amadeo. you'll receive four to six hundred dollars in your next tax bill. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brown, please, please. Mr. Brown, one minute. I want to thank my colleagues. I want to thank Stockton College and the press for holding this debate. On November 8, you will decide who will represent our interest in Trenton. When you vote, please be sure the team you choose has the knowledge, experience, and fortitude to do what is right and is able to stand up and fight for you and your family. I'm asking you to vote because I believe we deserve better. It's time for our government to stop saying things that they don't understand and start making changes. I will put the lessons I've learned as a small business owner to work for you and help us expand our economy and create jobs. And I will use my training and experience as an officer in the United States Army to provide that leadership with uncompromising integrity. Now I have to do something. I'm very blessed. I was supposed to say, uh, uh, go in with another paragraph, but with me tonight, I have my childhood love, Christine, and I have my three children, uh, Matt, Danny and Mallory. Now, I've worn a lot of titles, <laughs> Captain, Lieutenant. The ones I'm most proud of are husband Thank you. and father. Thank you, Mr. Thank Brown. Thank you. All right. Folks, oh, please. Our, um, Ms. Cooper, one minute, please. Not a day goes by that I, I don't meet someone who's not suffering in these very hard economic times. The family that can't afford other property taxes, the senior who's unable to pay for their prescription jobs, the veteran who can't obtain adequate health care, and the parent who can't earn a decent wage. That's why I'm running for the New Jersey Assembly. Now more than ever, middle class families of this state need elected officials who are on their side, who will stand up to the special interests in Trenton to do what's necessary to improve our community. My opponents are part of the status quo, a team that has failed Atlantic County's middle class families and seniors. No property tax relief, thousands without jobs, and an economic climate that won't breed success. It's time we put the priorities of our middle class families and seniors first to make government more efficient and one that will work for the interests of Atlanta County. Thank you so very much. And Mr. Tyner, one minute, please. Thank you. This election is about priorities. Assemblyman Amadeo has had more than three years in Trenton to show us that he has right priorities for Atlanta County in the second district. And guess what? He's failed to come through for nearly every family in this county, with the exception of 154 of them who earned more than $500,000. He supports giving them not a millionaire's tax, but a $40,000 tax break. That's more than most of us probably make in this room. He has supported policies that make it impossible to create jobs. He has voted to increase the financial burden on the middle class, including seniors, veterans, and the disabled. Chris Brown has made it clear that he would go along this road to perdition with Assemblyman Amadeo. As a state assemblyman, my priorities will be your priorities. Putting the middle class back to work, reducing property taxes, protecting seniors. I hope to earn your support on November 8th by showing that I have the kind of bold, common sense Thank ideas you, necessary Tyner. to help get Thank our you, state back on track. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much. Now, folks, on behalf of uh, Stockton College and the William Hughes uh, Center for Public Policy and the Press of Atlantic City, we want to thank you for coming out tonight. We hope this was very uh, informative and very educational. And please join me in thanking our candidates.
Senator. We had the abominable shutdown in July of 06. He couldn't get the executive order done. Governor Christie's first day on the job, John Amadeo and I were in the governor's office. We got the executive order done on the first day to keep the casinos open, so they will never be shut down again like we saw in July 2006. Thank you. <laughs> the, um... We need new product. A tourist town needs constantly to reinvent itself. And if you're not reinventing yourself, you're going to go into the decline that we saw Atlantic City experience in the pre-casino era, and we've seen Atlantic City experience these last several years. Before Governor Christie was in office, before he was the official candidate of the Republican Party, the East Coast Gaming Conference in the spring of 2009, I called for a deregulation bill and a boutique casino bill because that is the way to stimulate the new investment that we need. Those two things have helped jumpstart Revel and hopefully Hard Rock so we will see the new investment that we need so we can recapture the market. The convenience market is not going to return to Atlantic City. Somebody wants to go play slots for a few hours, they're going to stay closer to home. The transition to a full destination resort, new capital is required for that. That's what DREG, that's what I've done. Vince was hiding in the weeds on DREG and Boutique until the last day, and then he decided to come on and be a sponsor. Thank you very much. And if I could ask again to hold the, the applause until the end of the debate, please. And now our next question is from John Fujian. Senator Whale, uh, regarding the Casino Reinvestment Development Authority, what would you like to see the new director of the CRDA accomplish in his first six months? Well, I think, uh, again, it's about attracting investment back in. And uh, with all due respect to Senator Palestina, I'm proud of the investment that I captured while I was mayor. The Borgata, where would Atlantic City be without Borgata, the Walk, the Northeast Inlet? Uh, those are projects that were begun. Uh, in fairness, the Northeast Inlet began under Jim Ussery, but was implemented under me. And the other two are projects that I may not have cut the ribbon on, but they were frankly projects that the deals were done when I left office. Um, we need Creta to go out and attract investment, and part of doing that is they need to commit to beautifying the city and also to the use, quite frankly, of eminent domain. I know that's controversial, but the reality is you would not have the walk, you would not have Borgata, you would not have the Northeast Inlet, you would not have most of the other major developments in, in Atlantic City without that. When I left office, the city and CRDA made a decision, oh, we're not going to use eminent domain, that's too controversial. We're not going to have a demolition program. The city and CRDA abandoned demolition program. We were knocking down two or three buildings a week. They stopped that. So I think those two things, so you can go to developers and say, go out and acquire as much land as you can. If you run into a, a speculator, you run into someone who's unreasonable, the public sector will be there to back you up. And if you have a building in your neighborhood across the way that you need to uh, get knocked down because it's an eyesore, the public sector will be there to back you up. We haven't done that since I left office. I haven't been mayor the last 10 years. His friend, Lorenzo Langford, has been mayor for seven years. They've done, they've done nothing. They've done nothing with demolition, and they've done nothing uh, in terms of bringing developers in and giving them a climate in which they are willing to risk their capital. Thank you, Mr. Whelan. Well, thanks. Uh, the senator taking credit for uh, initiatives by Governor Whitman and the uh, former senator here are like the rooster uh, taking credit for the sun coming up. <laughs> that would be like my kids because they didn't oppose this stuff trying to take credit for it. Come on, we need the same thing that we have needed in Atlantic City uh, for the last 25 or 30 years he has been in office. We need a plan and then we need to figure out how to implement that plan. We have finally gotten the resources now that are necessary to get the plan implemented uh, with CREDA and with the city's budget. Uh, now it's a matter of developing a plan. And when you think about some of the boondoggles, uh, moving the bus terminal, borrowing money for a baseball stadium for 20 years when the baseball team only played for 11 years, uh, giving away property in the city of Atlantic City, his record is awful. 
we got to get a plan together and we got to start implementing. That's the only way we get the city turned around. Thank you very much. And now our next question from Sharon. Um, and this one will be for you, Assemblyman Palestina, and we'll switch to a little bit the topic a little bit to casino deregulation. Um, are you satisfied enough controls are in place after New Jersey deregulated what was considered the gold standard in casino regulation? And do you think anything else should have been done differently or be changed going forward? Well, I think we have to monitor it certainly uh, without question. We did, made a number of changes. Those changes are going to be published shortly. Uh, and we got to monitor that closely. We did have the model. It was the best regulatory system in the country. Uh, I am proud that we made a number of changes as that moved through the process. Uh, and the senator said I was in the weeds. I'll tell you where I was, was in the governor's office as the bill was being called for a vote, getting the changes that were necessary to both the tourism district bill and the regulatory reform bill. Uh, he talks about the boutique casino bill. I met with the governor's office when we finally jettisoned uh, the existing construction portion that was holding it up. Uh, so my record is clear. I have been a leader. I have uh, worked on all these pieces of legislation. We are going to continue uh, to work with the governor's office. And once again, you look at things in the DREG uh, that his bill put in. Tax breaks for casinos at the expense of seniors and disabled in this state. Uh, purse subsidies to racetracks while we need that revenue here to improve this city. We got those things changed so that money can be reinvested in the city of Atlantic City as it always should have been. The notion that we're going to continue to subsidize a failing industry while we are struggling to compete uh, is wrong and it had to end. So when you heard me uh, fighting for what I believe in, that was what I was doing. And just keep in mind, everyone, he's talking about some of Governor Christie's reforms. He had four years, Democratic legislature, Democratic governor with Corzine, uh, total control of state government. He got absolutely nothing done, including a simple executive order that could keep the casinos open so it would never be shut down on 4th of July weekend again. That's how ineffective this current senator is. Thank you. The, again, the notion that we had the model system. We may have had the model system back in 1978. But the reality is no one copied our model. Every other state was doing it cheaper, quicker in terms of the regulatory process. So uh, it may have been appropriate in 78 with the, the climate that existed then, uh, but the world had changed. And the first one to call for not tweaking the regulatory climate, but to tear it up and start all over was me in the spring of 09. You can look it up, OK? Um, the most significant amendment to the deregulation bill, Vince Palestine had nothing to do with. It's, it's the portion that the holder of the warrants doesn't have to get the, the full licensing because in conversations with Kevin DeSantis, that's what I do, I talk to the developers, he told me that was the problem. So we put that in. That was my amendment, and that's what got the money back Thank you for very much. Rebel. Now our next question is from John. Senator Whalen, how would your budget priorities differ if you win from the oppositions? Well, there, there's a huge difference in, in terms of budget priorities. Um, this year, and there's, there's no question, we're in tough times, and we need to tighten our belts as much as we can. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, when you look at where we started this budget cycle in February, the projections at that point for the state surplus was $300 million, which is and frankly, a low amount. By the time the budget discussions heated up in June, and we adopted the budget in June, um, the projections for the surplus was, depending on who you listen to, $600 million from the administration, $900 million from the office of OLS. We now know that OLS was closer to the mark than, um, than the administration was. And there were those of us, including me in the legislature, and the Democrats in the legislature, quite frankly, who said, OK, we have this surplus. We have more than we thought we were going to have. It's time to use some of that for property tax relief. It's time to use some of that to go back to the schools, back to the towns. Let me give you one specific example. One of the things we wanted to do is take 50 million of the surplus, send it back to towns for public safety, let them hire additional cops. 
Uh, that would have meant about 1.9 million for Atlantic County, 700,000 specifically for Atlantic City. We didn't get one Republican vote for that. Because the Republicans' idea of bipartisanship, Vince Palestino's idea of bipartisanship is we all vote together as Republicans and we get a few Democrats to vote with us. It's never the Democrats are over here, let's see if this is a good idea, whether it's 50 million there, whether it's restoring money for homestead rebate, uh, putting money back into our colleges, all of those middle class cuts, not to mention the fact that the Republicans, again, the only people who are doing better in New Jersey under Governor Christie are the millionaires. Because that cut went through when we tried to restore it, Vince Palestina doesn't vote for it, and the governor vetoes it. Thank you. Mr. Palestina? Yeah, we clearly have much different priorities when it comes to the state budget. Uh, and I will tell you what we are not going to do. It's not my words. Uh, we are not going to do what Jim Whalen did while he was the mayor of Atlantic City. Again, not my words, Moody's, credit agency, who we're hopefully all familiar with. Jim Whalen's political decisions to utilize reserves, one-shot revenues, and debt service restructuring resulted in a downgrade of the city's credit. <clears throat> Jim Whalen's debt and spending has crippled this town. You only need to look, for those of you that live in Atlantic City, at Atlantic City's debt burgeoning from under 70 million when he took over to 166 million when he left office as mayor. That type of debt has crippled this city. So that's what we're not going to do. We are going to be responsible, uh, fund the core priorities of government. Uh, we're not going to overestimate revenues. We're not going to use one-shot gimmicks. We're not going to incur debt. We can't do that any Thank longer. Thank you very much. Now our next question is from Sharon Shulman. Uh, we have a follow-up. Yeah, I would just like to follow up. Um, the budget is such an important uh, political document and governs so much in New Jersey. I'd like to just hear uh, a minute each on some specifics of what you stand for in the budget. Well, again, I, in terms of specifics, I would like to have seen two things. One, uh, the, uh, the Millionaire's Tax Enacted, which would have given us funds that we need to, to attack some of those middle class problems like property tax rebate restoration, uh, like helping schools, particularly suburban schools. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, let's use a little more surplus for one of the programs I just mentioned. But let, let me touch on this thing with Moody's. That evaluation came out after I left office, number one. Number two, uh, Mayor Langford did not meet with the representatives of Moody's. When I was mayor, I met with Moody's. I met with them in New York, I met with them in Atlantic City, I drove them around town, showed them what was happening with the investment that was going on, where the capital expenditure was going, what private investment was coming, and we had a good bond rating when I left office. The fact that, again, his friend, Mayor Langford, didn't want to go to New York or invite the Moody's people down uh, to explain where the city was going, I was out of office. I can't take responsibility for that. Thank you very much. Now, one minute from Mr. Palestina. He can argue with me. Uh, I don't think he can argue with Moody's, and the report was clear. His debt restructuring plan at the end of the administration was exactly the reading, reason for what was done. Uh, in terms of the budget, John, you know, we stand for making all of New Jersey affordable for everyone. For far too long, as I said before, we have overspent, we have overtaxed, we have overregulated, and we have incurred way too much debt. So in terms of the state budget, we are going to be responsible. We are going to estimate revenues. We're going to go back to a very simple concept that he doesn't understand and many other politicians don't understand. You take in so much, that means you spend the same amount. You don't go into this deficit spending. Uh, you don't borrow to bridge the gaps. You take money in, you spend it. And just real quickly, as I have said, the one thing that I am uh, fundamentally for is more equitable education funding. Kids throughout this state, parents, teachers, have been shortchanged. The notion that some communities are getting $30,000 a child Thank you, while Mr. others get four is wrong. We've got to get it changed. Thank you very much. Now the question is uh, Sharon. Okay. Um, and I'm going to go to Assemblyman Palestine again. Uh, and I, you all heard uh, Professor Rodriguez talk about how civility is near and dear to the heart of, um, of the Hughes Center. So. Suppose control of the legislature ends up splitting between the two parties. Would the two houses be able to work together? And what would you personally do if the second district legislative delegation is split to ensure it works for the best interests of the district? 
Well, thanks, Aaron. It has been split, and uh, certainly we hope that it changes hands. Uh, we're not hoping for a split this year. I think it should change hands because you look at the irresponsible behavior out of those that controlled Trenton, the Democrats, for the last 10 years. Uh, it's clear who put us in this mess, and it's pretty clear what we need to do to get out of this mess. Uh, that being said, as it relates to Atlantic City, uh, relates to our region, uh, we are talking to our colleagues on both sides of the aisle in the legislature all of the time. We work in a bipartisan fashion uh, on issues all of the time. So I don't think having a uh, split legislature uh, within the district, split legislature uh, in the state is going to affect that. We have proven uh, that we are able to work together. We have undertaken a number of fundamental reforms that are going to help the people of this state. Again, would not have happened if not for Governor Christie. Uh, when you think about some of the reforms we went, uh, have gotten done, uh, tax caps to control the growth of property taxes, uh, pension and benefit reform, uh, so that everybody is paying their fair share of those reforms. Uh, we've gotten a number of things done. Uh, as it relates to Atlantic City, uh, we are always uh, going to do what is best for Atlantic City. Uh, that's why I'm in this race, because I don't think we have done an adequate job uh, in the legislature of protecting Atlantic City, coming up with a plan, doing what was necessary. Uh, the senator has had 25 to 30 years to get the job done. Think about that. I was 11 years old when he started. Look at this city. All you need to do is go out, drive down Pacific Avenue, a block off the boardwalk, and in your mind, you uh, ask yourself, have we done what was necessary to get this city to be in a position to compete? And I will tell you, your answer will be no, we have not. I will get it done. Thank you. Mr. Whitten? Well. <clears throat> Again, um, be very happy to take you around and show you the projects in Atlantic City that are there because of me, whether it's the new high school, uh, a Boys and Girls Club, uh, improvements along the boardwalk, uh, as well as uh, things that I mentioned previously. But I thought the question was really about the bipartisanship. Um, we, have a, we have a split government now uh, with a Republican governor and Democratic legislature. We managed to get a budget passed the last two years. Um, and, and when you know, again, Senator Palestina talks about uh, the, the reforms we made. When the governor, to use his phrase, moves to the center of the room, we get things done. That's what happened with the 2% cap, because originally it was hard cap, no exemptions. How do you have a cap with no exemptions when you don't know what your energy costs are going to be, when you don't know what your health care costs are going to be? So when, we, when we, there was compromise, I don't think compromise is a dirty word. Compromise on issues, don't compromise on your principles. When there's compromise, we can get things done. When the Republicans refuse to compromise, we get stalemate. Thank you. Well, our next question is from John. <laughs> Senator, what, what do you think are the most important issues in this campaign? Well, I, I, uh, in my opening comment, I, I think jobs are clearly the most important issue. Um, as I said, we, you, you, can't, you can't just cut, cut, cut and expect the economy is going to turn around. We have to get people back to work. And government has a role in that. Um, so that's, that, to me, is the most significant issue. The, the, the second issue is we, as we get people back to work, and hopefully um, they're now contributing to society, they're now contributing to whether it's through state income tax or property tax or whatever, uh, we broaden the base, bring in more money, and are able to restore some of the cuts we have seen uh, across the board that have been devastating to our middle class. Um, you know, again, uh, Simon Palestina talks about uh, making school aid equitable. Uh, we had the opportunity to help the suburban districts. We didn't get any Republican support for that measure uh, in the Senate nor in the Assembly. So um, I, I think that's one area. Another area where uh, we need to do a better job uh, is with our colleges, not because Stockton is the sponsor of this. We are number one as a state in exporting our high school seniors. The highest percentage of high school seniors leave New Jersey and go out of state for their college education. Many of them, the best and the brightest, don't come back. We've got to change that, and we've got to find ways um, to support both the public institutions and the community colleges so we don't have that brain drain uh, of students leaving. So those are some of the priorities, but um, the wherewithal to do that comes about through growth 
and a fair tax structure where everyone, including the rich, the richest citizens among us, pay their fair share. Well, thanks. I think, uh, Sharon, he doesn't get a softball because of that next time. Um, he told you everything you need to know when he started. He said, don't cut, cut, cut. So that means he would have you spend, 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 which is what we have seen at every level of government for far too long. Now look, I am a small businessman who believes that lower taxes and less spending and less regulation and less debt are the ways that we are going to improve this economy and create jobs. We will not do it by government just simply going out and figuring out how to spend more money. We have seen that now in Washington. Uh, we have seen it in Trenton. We have seen it under his Atlantic City. It has not worked, and what you have to understand is that it will not work. We are not going to spend ourselves into creating long-term jobs. We've got to go in a different direction. We've got to get it turned around now. So jobs are the issue. A uh, much different Thank philosophy you. on how to get there. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> folks, again, if, if you can hold your applause until the end of the debate. Thank you. Now, our next question is from John. Oh, I'm, I believe it's my turn. Actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. We just had a long one there. That was all. Um, I'd like to, if you would please, Senator, uh, I'm sorry, Assemblyman Palestina, that's where we are. See, you got me all mixed up there. <laughs> Um, I would like for you to briefly address a few environmental issues. Um, the environmentalists say that the Christie administration so far is a mixed bag. Is enough being done to protect clean water, to adjust sprawl, and do you support New Jersey pulling out of REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative? Yeah, first to the last point of the question, I do support that. Uh, we need to make New Jersey more competitive uh, on many fronts. Uh, the utility taxes that were part of that uh, legislation are part of that. Uh, we need to reduce how much people are paying for utilities. Uh, we have to make New Jersey competitive with our neighboring states. Uh, he talks about income taxes. Uh, New York now has a lower income tax rate than the state of New Jersey. New Jersey cannot compete with our neighbors if we are uncompetitive uh, as it relates to those utility taxes, as it relates to income taxes, as it relates to property taxes. So in order for New Jersey to be competitive, uh, those are the types of things I need to do, we need to do. Uh, in terms of the environmental thing, I think Governor Christie's uh, policy has been clear. We are going to protect the environment, but we're not going to do it at the sacrifice of jobs and the economy. We, for far too long, had over-regulated this state, and I see it as a professional engineer, professional planner, uh, when you try to go in and you try to create economic development and you try to do something to create jobs, you are stymied in many cases by state agencies and county agencies and local agencies that work development, that stymie jobs. And it is one of the problems that we have had in this state without question. So on all these fronts, taxes, uh, environment, we need to understand uh, New Jersey has got to be competitive with our neighbors. Uh, we have to make sure that all of these things allow us to be competitive. Uh, we saw 70 billion dollars of wealth leave New Jersey over the last decade. We got to turn that around. The only way to do it is to make New Jersey more affordable, make it more competitive so that we can start keeping people here and attracting new people here and attracting businesses here. Uh, the way to get it done is what I am talking about. Thank you. Mr. Whelan? <coughs> we, we should be back in Reggie. All of our neighboring states except Pennsylvania are in Reggie. Uh, the governor in his first year took $60 million of Reggie money, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and instead of doing it what, with it what the legislature had put into the bill, uh, he used it to balance the budget. That money should go to the creation of green jobs. Now, there are two things, two things that, that should spur our commitment to green energy. We are so far behind the rest of the world as I said in my opening statements, China spends 10 times more than we do. You say, well, that's a low-wage state. Germany, uh, Denmark, England, way ahead of us on wind power and hydroelectric. Brazil is ahead of us on biofuels. Now, I don't want to be behind Brazil on anything except soccer. And we are continuing to rely on Middle East oil to drive our economy. What happens when that runs out? 
What happens when the Arab Spring hits Saudi Arabia? Thank We've got to much, get back into Reggie, use that money to stimulate jobs. Thank you very much. And now, uh, this question, uh, uh, this question is, uh, will be from John. Okay, Senator Well, do you consider horse breeding and horse racing to be just another business, or is it a special industry with public value that deserves public financial support? And what's the difference between subsidies for racing and state help in financing the Revel project? The difference is jobs. Um, when this, and this is just a simple economic model. When you look at Revel and the investment that goes in, or you look at Borgata and the investment that went in, investment in Borgata was $330 million. Uh, the, the capital investment of Borgata was over a billion. The return, the annual return, uh, on all the public taxes that Borgata generates is over 100 million. So the, the investment up front is returned uh, over and over again uh, to the state and the other entities that, that made that commitment on the tunnel. Uh, I don't think you get that return in the horse racing industry. And when I joined the legislature, I inherited the uh, subsidy going into the tracks. Um, the reality is that people's tastes change. Horse racing used to be immensely popular in this country. So was boxing at one time. They have both, for whatever reasons, diminished in popularity. Uh, we don't say, well, gee, we should subsidize boxing because, you know, it used to be popular. Uh, uh, I do agree with the governor that horse racing has to stand on its own. Uh, and the bills that we have put in move it in that direction. So I don't think it's some uh, sacred cow or sacred horse, if you will, to say, well, you know, we have to continue to subsidize this. I do think, you know, uh, again, uh, it's a matter of people's taste changing. Um, you know, as I say, basketball is more popular than boxing now. So I think that um, uh, that's one area where the governor and I, and I assume the gentlemen do agree. Thank you. Mr. Palacino? Yeah, I mean, as you, I think I've been very clear. Uh, $170 million over the last seven years. The casinos were blackmailed, essentially, to subsidize horse racing in this state. $170 million that could have been reinvested back into the city to do all the things that he failed to do uh, while he was in all these leadership positions, councilman, mayor, assembly, senate. We could have used that money. So I am clear, uh, no more subsidizing racing in this state at the expense of the casinos. Now, in terms of revel and the racetracks, totally different. The REVEL program allows us to reinvest future taxes and it's going back not into the building primarily but into the area, exactly what I'm talking about. Cleaning up Atlantic City, uh, taking care of some of these problems. The racetracks were just a direct subsidy. This is a program that allows us through future taxes when the project is successful, reinvest them back in the community and I am proud that we got Governor Christie uh, to get that done for Thank REVEL. Thank you very much. No. Our next question from Sharon. Um, I want to address this to the Assemblyman, but I'm asking that both of you be very specific um, on, on addressing this question. Uh, in light of the fact that the Governor vetoed a, a job creation bill last spring, what can be done to stimulate jobs in the economy, not just in Atlantic City, but in the district and in the state? Specifically, what would you do? Well, look, I think I talked about this earlier, Sharon. Uh, we have seen a number of these stimulus programs, whether it's at the state level under John Corzine, uh, under the president. Clearly, they haven't worked. Uh, Jim Whalen supported John Corzine's uh, stimulus program, you know, lauded it, keeping New Jerseyans working by creating jobs throughout the state. At that point, when he said that, unemployment was at 7%. Unemployment around here now is 14%. Why is Atlantic City struggling? Because we have essentially a convenience gaming resort. And so what are we going to do? Uh, first, at the state level, as you heard me say, we are going to stop the spending, stop the borrowing, stop the overregulation, stop these one-shot gimmicks that he has done in Atlantic City, that he did with John Corzine while he was there serving with him for four years. We're going to put an end to it. And you've seen the governor do that. That is the first thing. Uh, that needs to be done in order to get this economy turned around and give people some confidence. Think about what has happened to people 
over the last few years. Confidence has eroded because you have Washington all the time telling us the sky is falling. And so what you need to do is give people some confidence, let them keep more of their money uh, as a start and stop confiscating it so you can spend it on all these pet projects uh, that you have. Now in terms of Atlantic City, we have talked about that as well. He had 25 years to come up with a plan and to start implementing that plan. Wasn't done. It is a complete uh, failure of his administration because we did all these boondoggles, wasted all the, this money. So in terms of Atlantic City, we're going to use the resources we have to get a plan together. We're going to use those resources to start implementing the plan. We are going to build a destination resort uh, so that we have more than just convenience gaming. That's what has to be done. And again, that's what I will do once I'm your senator. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whelan? Well, I, I thought the question was some very specifics. Instead, you got the generalities and the attack. But um, let, let, me, let me try to give you some specifics. Uh, this coming Monday uh, at the Commerce Committee in the Senate, uh, there's a small business loan program bill that will be up for businesses that employ between, 90, uh, between 10 and 99 employees. Uh, where they will be able to borrow money up to 250000 at 2%, uh, provided that there is a, a job creation element to their expansion. Um, th there, I'm working on a bill right now to extend the ERG concept, uh, which gives a, proper, gives a sales tax break. Uh, take that concept, let's, expend, uh, let's extend that to uh, hospitals and possibly even to the colleges so that employees there would get a tax break and the colleges and the hospitals would get a tax break. Uh, as they create new jobs. Government has a role to play in creating jobs. Um, we can sit here and do nothing, or we can sit here and have platitudes, and we're going to get nothing and get platitudes. Thank you very much. Now, John, the next question. Okay. Shift gears a little, so to speak. Uh, what changes, if any, may be needed in New Jersey's graduated driver license program and the decal program for new drivers? This is for Senator Whale, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I, I actually voted against the decal program. I, I, it just doesn't make sense. Frankly, our police have enough to do without looking at a decal and looking at their watch and, and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I, I'm not sure that, um, you know, that the decal program is effective or workable. Uh, and I think I was one of a handful of, of legislators who actually voted against it. I mean, it was very popular at the time, but again, I just didn't think it was practical. Um, you know, some of this is, uh, comes back to uh, government not being big brother, as we try to do with the decal program, uh, and some of this comes back to uh, parenting and making sure that uh, there is information out there for families uh, through schools or community centers and so on on how to make sure their kids are driving safely. We, we all experience this community as a community, experience a terrible tragedy uh, not too long ago at Mainland Regional High School. And um, like I'm sure most of us here, I, I knew some of the families and, and so on. Um, we, we can't just say, well, that's kids being kids. But by the same token, I, I don't think you're going to legislate, be able to legislate a decal and prevent what happened there. I think it's really uh, a better flow of information um, to the families and to the teenagers. I, I, I recall one hearing um, where um, there was a family of a, of a student who uh, was killed for not wearing a seatbelt. And those parents of that child took it upon themselves to visit the school where he, where he attended, um, and they were told that there are, there are kids in that school who absolutely put their seatbelt on every time because of that kind of communication. I think that's probably a more effective way than trying to pass a bill and uh, something, again, that's probably not workable or enforceable. Thank you. Mr. Palestino? Well, thanks, uh, John. The, the decal should go away. Um, we've been clear on that. They should be gone, and a lot of people did vote for it. Um, but the Attorney General is looking at that overall uh, graduated driver's license program. Uh, we're going to let the Attorney General review it as we should. They're the professionals, uh, make recommendations, and then whatever the Attorney General's recommendations are, hopefully uh, we work together again in a bipartisan fashion and get it done. Uh, just back to the last point. Now you talked about another program where we're going to come up with a loan program. And uh, of course, government has a role. We're going to look at some of these things. But it just shows how out of touch some people are. I'm a small businessman. 
And any of you out there in business know you're not hiring employees and borrowing money until you have more sales. It is fundamental to running a business. So until you get sales, we get this economy turned around and we stop spending and stop borrowing, people aren't going to be borrowing money because they have no confidence. That's what we got to do uh, in order to get this economy turned around and start creating jobs. Thank you very much. Now this question is from Sharon. Mike. Okay. Um, we're going to deviate a little bit and ask you to each take one minute, and I'll start with the Sunwoman Palestina. Would you tell me what it is about your background that makes you uniquely qualified for this elected office? Well, my background is, of course, in professional engineer and professional planning. I've uh, been here all my life. Uh, proud to call Atlanta County home, along with my wife, born and raised here uh, in Galloway Township. Uh, so, you know, I have a vested interest in uh, what happens in this region. And the, comp the real difference uh, between myself and Senator Whalen, why am I uniquely uh, qualified to do this job? My, what I do for a living, uh, my family uh, being here, uh, one minute, depends on a vibrant Atlantic City and a vibrant region. So I have a vested interest in making sure uh, that we do what is necessary in Atlantic City and that we get this turned around. My opponent, always had public paychecks throughout his life. I don't know that he's ever had a paycheck from a private source. He gets paid from public entities regardless of what happens to our region uh, and to our economy. And so there is a tremendous difference in terms of why I am qualified uh, versus Thank you very much. Uh, one minute, Mr. Whalen. Uh, first, let me confess, I wasn't born here. I was born in Philadelphia. I didn't have a choice in the matter. Um, <laughs> I, I, got here, I got here as quick as I could, but, um, uh, and throughout my uh, working years, it is true, I have been a public school teacher. I'm proud to be a public school teacher. Uh, and when the downturn came, um, I voluntarily took a pay cut. Now, Senator Palestina says um, he, you know, uh, is in a private businessman. He makes his money, his business is public contracts. No bid public contracts. As an engineer, as an engineer, and, and that is, folks, please. That is his business. But please, spare us the hypocrisy. I make a living as a school teacher. I'm proud to be a school teacher. When the crunch came, I gave back. He makes his living on public no bid contracts. Thank you very much, Mr. Whelan. Now we're back to the traditional format, uh, yes. two-minute question for uh, John. Senator Whalen, could I have your reaction to the new education standards being proposed by Governor Chris Christie? Um, I believe we're having the wrong conversation about education. We are having the wrong conversation. Um, tenure reform, yes, it, we need to make some changes in tenure. The process is too lengthy and too costly. Um, charter schools, vouchers, and so on. The most comprehensive study that I'm aware of on charter schools was done a few years ago by Stanford University. And what they found is that some charter schools do better than the nearby public school. More actually do worse, and most do about the same. So all we're doing with charter schools is removing uh, dollars from the existing public school structure, and we would do the same thing if vouchers moves to the forefront, and crippling the existing public schools that we have. Now, people in New Jersey uh, hold up the Robert Treat School in Newark as this great model of, of what a charter school or what a public school should be. Uh, and, and they're very successful. There are two things we need to know. First, and this is the conversation we should be having. First, we go to school 180 days a year because we used to be a nation of farmers. Robert Treat goes to school over 200 days a year. Now, my, my teacher friends are with me on the first part, when I'm against charters and vouchers and uh, the, the, the crazy system, they want two bad years in a row and you're out and this kind of stuff on tenure reform. Uh, they're not with me on this part, frankly, when I start talking about longer school days, longer school years. But that's where we have to go. The rest of the world does not go to school 180 days. India, China, Japan, Germany, Europe, they're going to school over 200 days. So that's the kind of commitment that I think we need to do. 
That's the conversation we should be having in terms of school reform. Thank you. Mr. Palacino? Thank you. Uh, certainly a support number of the proposals. Look, in education, uh, we have seen us going the wrong way again. We need to increase choice. We need to increase competition. We need more equitable uh, school funding so that all children are treated equally. I think that is clear. And the notion that money is going to solve problems in education is so fundamentally wrong. We have seen, and it is acknowledged uh, by the experts, that kids are getting further from proficiency despite the spending. Uh, and so we clearly need to go in a different direction, and we'll work along with the governor in that. In terms of the last one, uh, there he goes again with my business. He tried it in 2007. He's trying it again. Uh, look, I grew up here. I took a risk when I was 32 years old, started a business, uh, hire employees, pay for health care, uh, do everything that this country is about. Yes, uh, I do have some public contracts, as all engineers do, and my business is the same before I was elected as it is after I was elected. Thank you very much. No difference. Now, uh, this will be our, um, we have time for one more round of questions before the one. closing statements. And I'm sorry, started. Michael, I, I couldn't hear. Thank one more question. Uh, we're going to do one more question. One more question. And right. then uh, the closing statements, and I believe the question comes from Sharon. Yes, um, Assemblyman in Palestina. Should Chris Christie run for president? Why or why not? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, selfishly, um, because we have started a number of the reforms, I would say Chris should not run for president. Uh, at this point in time, look, we have made tremendous changes in this state uh, and in Atlantic City over the last 18 months. I am proud uh, during the campaign with the governor uh, since he has been elected uh, to work with him on a number of the fundamental reforms uh, that were necessary to get this state back to solvency and to start reinvesting into Atlantic City. Of course, he says all the time he has a job to do and he is committed uh, to getting that job done and I support him staying here as governor uh, for now. You know, we'll see what happens in the future. But look, the governor has a mess to clean up. It is a mess created by Trenton Democrats. We have a mess in Atlantic City uh, that I will tell you uh, that Jim Whalen has been in leadership positions in Atlantic City uh, for 25 years. I don't know that you would have a single person to point to that has had more to do with Atlantic City uh, during that time. And now we finally, in the last 18 months, get a governor who understands, once again, four years in the legislature uh, to clean up the messes he made as mayor in Atlantic City. He couldn't get it done. 18 months, John Amadeo and I, with Governor Christie, working closely with him, and you see the changes starting to occur. Uh, this governor is a leader. This governor has taken on the tough issues. I am proud to stand with him on those tough issues when we agree with him uh, and also have been at odds with him on certain things and will be independent uh, and speak my mind, as many of you in this room know, uh, when I think the governor is going in the wrong direction. So uh, proud to implement a number of the reforms we got done in Atlantic City. We've seen tremendous transformation due to this governor, first governor uh, since casinos started to actually pay attention. And I will tell you, uh, John Amadeo and I take a lot of that credit along with our county executive and some others Thank who you. met with the governor. Thank you very much and one minute response. Yeah, uh, whether he runs for president or not is an issue for the other side. Yeah, I will give the governor credit because I think he has identified some key issues like pension benefits reform and like the climate. Uh, but I wish he were uh, less abrasive, quite honestly, in the spirit of civics that, that the Years Institute is a part of. But, you know, again, this, this notion that we have a convention center right over here. That was built by Governor Florio. We have improvements to that airport that have been done by a number of governors, starting with Governor Florio, continue with Governor Whitman. So the notion that uh, Governor Christie is the only one who's ever done anything in Atlantic City, or that nothing happened until John Amadeo and Vince Palestina got to, uh, got to Trenton. We, we built a, when I left office as mayor, we had an over $5 billion casino industry. I haven't been mayor for the last 10 years. It's gone down since then. Talk to Mayor Lanford about that. Thank you. And now we will do the closing statements for one minute of, uh, for each candidate. And we'll begin with Senator Whalen. 
We have seen tonight and will continue to see a very clear contrast between myself and my opponent. I would prefer that this campaign focus on jobs and, and spending cuts. A Senate Palestino has chosen to attack in his ads and to misrepresent my record. John Adams told us years ago, facts are stubborn things. Here are some facts. The 1990s are the only decade since the 1920s when the population of Atlantic City actually went up. Crime and unemployment went down, and the size of the city's workforce decreased. The bad economy hit. I voluntarily took a pay cut to save swim program for kids in Atlantic City, because I believe if I'm going to talk about shared sacrifice, I have to set the example. Senator Palestino has garnered millions in public contracts, and I said before, that's his business, but spare us the hypocrisy. There is a difference between us on issues and on character. I'm proud of my record as mayor, as a teacher, and as a senator, and I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. We'll give you a pause at the end, folks. Uh, Mr. Palacino, please. Well, thank you. It's uh, funny to hear the senator uh, talk about attacks after he ran the most negative campaigns in Atlantic County history against his last two opponents. What a hypocrisy that is. Uh, in terms of what we have talked about tonight, you have seen a clear uh, contrast. Uh, versus from someone who believes that less spending and lower taxes, uh, less debt are the way to improve the economy and create jobs. Someone who is focused not on all the big stuff in Atlantic City, but on building a city to go along with the buildings, uh, which is what should have been done for the last 25, uh, 30 years. Uh, and look, if you're happy with the state of the city, if you're happy with all these job losses, people leaving the state, businesses leaving the state, there you go. But you have given him 25 years in elected office. 25 years. Look at what we are left with. Unemployment, overspending. Give me two years, and I will promise you we will get it turned around. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. It seems um, it seems rather evident that there's a certain degree of enthusiasm for these candidates, so please join me in thanking them. Well, if we could ask... Uh